Well, in the current landscape of college football, do the big only get bigger? Do the rich only get richer? Or are some of the smaller schools actually at an advantage? On today's episode of Locked on LSU, we'll take a look into the changing landscape of NIL, what that could mean for LSU, and what that could mean for college football as a whole. All of that and more on today's edition of Locked on LSU. You are Locked on LSU, your daily podcast on the LSU Tigers. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, thank you for making Locked On LSU your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. I am Caroline Fenton, and I am your host. I am an LSU alum, I'm a diehard LSU fan, and I now host Sports Talk Radio here in Nashville for ESPN 1025 The Game. You can follow me on Twitter at Caroline Fenton. One, you can also follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked on LSU. You can interact with me there or you can interact with me on YouTube as well because you can listen to the podcast, of course, whether that's Spotify, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, whatever your preferred pod- podcast platform is. You can listen there, but you can also watch the podcast on YouTube. So you can throw it up on your smart TV, throw it up on your computer, on your phone, whatever that might be. Just make sure that you subscribe to the Locked on LSU YouTube channel. Just hit that subscribe button and you'll get notified as soon as Locked on LSU drops so you won't miss a second of your LSU content. But Ross Dellinger and the rest of the Sports Illustrated staff put out a really interesting article on NIL and this changing landscape of NIL. And the changing landscape of NIL in just the short period of time that NIL has existed and really the changing landscape of college football as a whole. So I don't know if you've seen this movie. It's called Safety. It's one of those movies that I watched when I was in peak quarantine and I was bored out of my mind, but I was really blown away with how great the movie was. It's called Safety. It's on Disney+. Plus. Recommend it. I would, I would check it out if I were you. Um, but it's about this, this, it's a true story based on this former Clemson player. And he came from a broken home. His mother was, you know, in and out of rehab, in and out of jail with a drug problem. And his little brother was kind of left to his own devices. So his older brother who played football for Clemson, afraid of, you know, some of the people that his little brother might get mixed up with, um, kind of brought him in and essentially brought him into his dorm room at Clemson, which at the time was against the rules. And long story short, he elicited the help of coaches, wives and families to help you know, drive his little brother to school and to take him shopping for shoes that he'd wear to school. Essentially just to help this kid out who's a student athlete who was also raising his little brother. And the NCAA intervened and said that that was a violation of NCAA rules, that they couldn't get any assistance from boosters, from coaches' families, coaches' wives, um, whether that's just emotional support, just help taking him places where he needed to go, financial support. That wasn't allowed. He had an NCAA hearing that was the definitive decision of whether he could play college football or not. And I'll let you watch the movie to figure out, you know, kind of what happens there. But it's wild now in the era of NIL that we're in, the fact that that ever happened, the fact that there was a, a booster or a coach's wife who was taking this poor, sweet little boy to school because his brother couldn't take him to school because he was going to class or going to practice. And there was an NCAA hearing for it. Times have changed. We are in a completely new era of college football. And I know we hear it all the time, but it truly is the wild, wild west. Nothing is off limits anymore. The article on sportsillustrated.com cites SMU, for example, before they got the death penalty. You know, these football players, these 18, 19, 20-year-old kids coming in with Rolexes and gold rings and these beautiful outfits, and they're 20 years old because they've been paid so much money by boosters of SMU. And of course, we know what happened. SMU got the death penalty, and they're probably looking back now and thinking, wow, we were just 40 years too early because SMU was doing exactly what college football programs are doing now. And we've kind of veered off the original intent of NIL. I think we lose sight of the fact that NIL means name, image, and likeness. So 
of course, players were able to profit off of their name, image, and likenesses. We saw some of the early NIL deals. You look at DJ Uyunglele of Clemson having a deal with Dr. Pepper. You look at um, Bo Nix with his Milo Sweet Tea sponsorship because that's exactly what it was. Where if DJ Uyunglele wants to be in a commercial for Dr. Pepper, you can get paid for that. If Jamar Chase wants to sell t-shirts. I know that he was out of the era of NIL. I'm just, you know, speaking hypothetically. Wants to sell t-shirts with his face on it with a with a tagline of his. He can do that. He can sell those shirts and he can make money off of it. Off of your name, your image, and your likeness. But in just the short period of time that NIL has existed, less than a year now, it has completely gone off the rails. Now, boosters are essentially just funneling money. It's essentially pay to play. It's essentially recruiting with money. And that's not obviously not the original intent. But what I have to say about that is, what did you expect? The Supreme Court unanimously ruled that NAL was constitutional was that what was what the NCAA was doing not allowing student athletes to profit off their their meme image and likeness was unconstitutional and they stated that you cannot put a cap on the amount of money that you can pay college football players you cannot regulate it um beyond just states regulating the, the rules for college athletes so I have to say what did you expect what did you think was going to happen that these college football programs weren't going to do whatever it takes within the rules, and now there really are none, to get the players that they want. Because what started with brand endorsement deals or t-shirt deals or being able to sell memorabilia of yours has turned in to collectives or boosters or wealthy alumni funneling a, you know, handing a check over to these college football players and calling it NIL. The article cites collectives or groups that have been established since NIL's birth. Um, you look at one the article cites, it's called Burn Ends. Cute little, you know, cute. Um, it's a collective in Texas that was that, whose plan was to d- distribute $70,000 of a pot to go to tight ends in the state of Texas. So we saw that kind of start of these groups that would raise money and would would bring in whatever cash that they could in order to essentially recruit players. Let's say, hypothetically, you know, I own a business in Baton Rouge. I want this player from Georgia to come to LSU. I'll give you, you know, if you tweet out about my business, I'll give you $2 million for it. And I'd love $2 million to just give away like that. But that's essentially what it's turned into. And then you also look at the booster side of things. That when SMU got the death penalty, their boosters were handing over six, seven figure salaries, stipends, allowances, whatever you want to call it, in order to, you know, to pay for their play, essentially, in order to recruit these players to SMU. That's exactly what we're doing now. It's not just a Milo sweet tea endorsement. It's not just DJ Uyengale collecting a check for a Dr. Pepper commercial that he appeared in. It's now boosters essentially camouflaging NIL deals or putting just boatloads of money into this pot and telling the athletic directors and the coaches and the higher ups at the universities, this is what we're giving you and go pick out, go shop for whatever recruit you want. Now, I don't have a problem with that necessarily because those there are no rules. There's nothing that regulates that. So how can I have a problem with that? Also, how can I have a problem with something that my school, that LSU, has had a lot of success doing? There's not a shortage of wealthy alumni from LSU who are willing to put forth the money for a competitive football team. I'm, I am not naive of that. But it's not sustainable. Lane Kiffin spoke to the media a few months ago. I remember I put it in the podcast a couple months ago, talking about how, you know, it truly is the Wild West and Ole Miss, which has a smaller alumni circle than, let's say, Texas A&M. Texas A&M sitting on a literal gold mine in the oil fields that surrounds College Station, that Ole Miss just isn't getting the kind of cash that Texas A&M is getting, that it was unsustainable. 
And although I, I, I embrace NIL wholeheartedly, I think it's about damn time that these players are able to get a cut of the millions of dollars that have been funneled into the pockets of boosters and athletic directors and higher ups at universities, because, you know, they're the ones on the field. They should be the ones that are able to capitalize off of it. But I believe it's headed in a, in a pretty scary direction if there isn't some sort of cap or regulation or standardization across the board with NIL. But there's one question that I have about it as well. It absolutely will have a long-term impact on college football as long as NIL will be in existence. And as far as I'm concerned, as far as I understand, NIL will never not be in existence in college football. This is just the new normal for us. Um, But what does that mean long-term for college football? Do the big get bigger? Do the rich get richer? Or do the small schools finally have an opportunity to kind of get their foot in the door with the recruits that they want, with the kind of talent that they can buy? I want to get into that coming up next. But before we do that, I want to tell you about Bet Online because Bet Online is your source for all of your betting stats uh, and sports information. You can find all the latest sports develop- developments. They've got league reviews and news. They've got this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball, and this weekend's run to the Roses at the Kentucky Derby back finally. <coughs> Excuse me. I love betting on horses. I I picked the one with the cutest name or the one with the prettiest colors on that the, the jockey is wearing. So please don't take any of my betting advice. But you know absolutely that I will be on BetOnline.net this weekend betting on some Kentucky, horse, Kentucky Derby horses. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sporting wagering information. They've got live betting, playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, where the game starts. Thank you for making Locked on LSU your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube as well. So make sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube. But let's fast forward to, I believe it was winter time, November, December, something around there. The name Travis Hunter, if that rings a bell. Travis Hunter was the number one recruit coming out of, out of high school football. He was a corner out of Georgia. Um, he was originally committed to Florida State, and he had offers from Auburn, Georgia, Alabama, you name it, schools across the South. This is the number one recruit in, in high school football we're talking here. So he really could have had the pick of the litter of wherever he wanted to go. He was originally committed to Florida State. And then last minute on his, his official signing day, he put on a Jackson State hat. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, Jackson State and HBCU, Deion Sanders is their head coach. So, and he came out and said, you know, being able to play for Jackson State is, I I feel like I'm blazing a trail for really talented high school football players to bring their talent to HBCUs. And I respect that wholeheartedly. I understand, you know, playing for Deion Sanders, for Coach Prime, like that's a huge deal. And he would be a wonderful person to be a mentor for you or even to follow in the footsteps of Coach Prime. I get it. I, I totally understand. But something is... Something is, doesn't totally add up there. Because if I'm a high school football player, my goal is to get to the NFL. One might say that Alabama, Auburn, Georgia, Florida State, the big time programs, those are going to be the programs that set you up for the most success in the NFL. Travis Hunter decided to go to Jackson State because that's the school that paid him the most money. Also, then again, I, like, I don't blame the kid. Go where you're going to get paid. And of course you get to blaze a trail going to an HBCU. And of course you get to play for a legendary coach in Deion Sanders, a legendary football player. But would he have gone to Jackson State if it wasn't for the money? I don't know. I, I don't know Travis Hunter personally. I can't say for certain. But I have to believe probably not. If money wasn't even an object, Probably not, right? You go to Florida State, you go to Auburn, you go to Georgia, you go to these big-time football programs that will set you up for success. You want to compete for a national championship. Jackson State most likely will not be doing that when his, with his time there. Maybe they will. I don't I don't foresee it. I'm not going to put my money on it. So we look at so much with NIL and we say, you know, the big's getting bigger. Texas A&M, for example, they've got millions of dollars in their boosters and alumni organizations. And they're able to pay their players as such. 
University of Tennessee, for example, also a, a massive alumni network that's willing to put in as much money as they possibly can in order to get back to their glory days. They're paying their incoming quarterback $8 million across his four years. So you may be a smaller program that looks at that and says, we can't, we cannot get these players because we can't pay them $8 million because we don't have the kind of cash or alumni support or even just brands that are willing to dish out that amount of money in order to get a player to play there. So you would think that the big get bigger, right? The schools that have the most money can afford the best players. But I also go back to Travis Hunter, and that's my one caveat here. Maybe he's the outlier. Maybe he's the exception and not the rule. But I really will not be surprised if you start to see some of these smaller schools that otherwise would have been irrelevant in terms of recruiting or in terms of even their competitiveness in the regular season that start to land big name recruits and that start to be competitive. Look at Vanderbilt, for example, in the SEC. Why would we ever be intimidated about anything that Vanderbilt does? Well, if there's a Vanderbilt alum out there that's just sitting on loads of cash that he wants to boost up the football program, he or she wants to boost up the football program, like why not dish out $10 million if you have it to the, the football player that you want to come to your school's program? Maybe that player wanted to go to Alabama, a five-star you know, one of the top players in the country. Maybe they wanted to go to LSU. Maybe that player wanted to go to USC. Maybe that was a quarterback that wanted to throw underneath Lincoln Riley because that's where he thought that they would have the best chance of getting the NFL. If Vanderbilt flashes a sexy number like that, that's where you're going. Because right now, in the age of NIL, football isn't the only thing. The NFL isn't the only thing. Money is attached to it as well. And I also do wonder this. How much of it is a status symbol among high school recruits? I look at wide receivers in the NFL, for example. Because I mean, the, the wide receiver contracts in the NFL are skyrocketing. It's getting to the point where your quarterback is your highest paid player on the field and your wide receiver is not too far behind him. There has almost been like a rat race with wide receivers to say like, okay, well, this guy's making... 20 a year, I want 25 a year. And $25 million a year for a wide receiver in the NFL is astronomical. We saw it with quarterbacks not too long ago. You know, Patrick Mahomes got paid. So then Josh Allen wanted to get paid. So then Deshaun Watson wanted to get paid. And then now Lamar Jackson is going to want to get paid. It's all keeping up with the Joneses. And whenever another player gets paid, the, the, the ceiling just gets pushed up a little bit more. I do wonder if there's some sort of like status symbol among high school recruits to look at this player in Nico Amalavea going to Tennessee and saying, oh, well, he's making $8 million. He's got, he got an $8 million deal from Tennessee. These are my stats. I'm better than him. So I want $9 million from Tennessee or Florida or LSU or Alabama. I mean, in the age of NIL, isn't it not just essentially NFL free agency? Are you not just trying to put the best contract in front of a player and do whatever it takes to get him in there. And then that brings me back to my big get bigger versus smaller get small, small get smaller discussion. If the ceiling keeps getting pushed up, then who is going to be able to afford these players at a certain point? It's all very interesting and it's all kind of unraveling before our eyes. It's been, it's been, advancing at like warp speed because if you think about it like we haven't even had an IL for a full year I believe it was past maybe mid to late July maybe early August of last year it hasn't even been a full year and we went from Bo Nix posting pictures of Milo's sweet tea on his Instagram to Travis Hunter the number one player in high school football switching from a, a powerhouse fo uh, college football program to one of the, the highest ranked recruits in to go to an HBCU in HBCU history. We've gone from DJ Uengale, go you know, hyping up Dr. Pepper to players getting paid seven figure salaries. Essentially salaries. That's what it is. The collectives and the boosters at college football. You know, in boosters, for example, you know, 
they're probably just like a fly, like just an annoying gnat that you wanted to swipe away before then for in terms of, you know, inside the, the walls of college football. You know, if I'm a college football coach, probably didn't want to deal with boosters in the past. But now the boosters hold all the control. Now the college coaches have to kiss up to the boosters to be willing to dish out the cash. And it's in such an interesting era of college football that we're in. So I can't really definitively say whether or not the big get bigger or the small get smaller. All I can say is things are changing. Things are different. And I do wonder what additional change are coming down the pipe. Now coming up next, I have neglected your questions all week and I apologize for that. So we'll get into a mailbag segment next um, Next segment. We will um, get all of your LSU questions, whatever you might have, get those out and I'll answer as many questions as I possibly can. Remember that every week I do a mailbag. Um, I try to do it every Wednesday. Mailbag Wednesday. So send the questions if you have anything that you'd like to address. I'd be happy to do it every week with the mailbag. Um, we'll get into that coming up after just a couple short words from our sponsors. Well, thank you for making Locked on LSU your first listen every day. Let's get your questions because this is a day for the people. I want to answer your LSU questions first and foremost. Um, I've gotten this question a couple times actually, and I got a few questions in for this week kind of along these same lines because I had Alex Frank, who is the host of Locked on Bearcats, does a wonderful job hosting Locked on Bearcats. And I asked him, you know, oh, he knows Mike Denbrock better than, than we do, Mike Denbrock and his tenure at Cincinnati. And I Alex kind of you know these are the four quarterbacks in um in the in LSU's quarterback room this is like kind of their their strengths and weaknesses what do you think fits um Mike Denbrock's system best and I think a lot of questions came from this question in particular says do you think Jaden Daniels will start because of Denbrock's past with Desmond Ritter now when I asked Alex about you know the four quarterbacks what Mike Denbrock would um kind of is his bread and butter I explained to him that Jaden Daniels is a very run-first quarterback, that he's got a very strong arm. Um, but in the spring game, for example, he didn't look very sure of himself. He made a few mistakes, but he's incredibly talented with his legs. And Alex told me that Mike Denbrock, with his history with Desmond Ritter, who was kind of the same, kind of had some a little rough around the edges that he needed to refine in terms of his arm, but was was such a talented runner and was a certified dual threat. I think that's what we're working with a lot here with Jaden Daniels. And so one might say that, okay, you look at the strengths of Jaden Daniels and they mirror the the traits of Desmond Ritter so much so. So it would feel like, okay, if Mike Denbrock was able to kind of tailor and groom Desmond Ritter into a quarterback that carried his team to the college football playoff, could he not do that with Jaden Daniels as well? Um, and I think that's a totally valid argument, and I think it's something that's very interesting to see how that plays out. But Jaden Daniels isn't Desmond Ritter, even though he has a very similar skill set. Um, maybe it was just the relationship that Mike Denbrock had with Desmond Ritter that they just clicked so well. I don't know, you know. So I'm not going to say that just because Mike Denbrock was able to kind of groom Desmond Ritter into now, you know, an NFL quarterback, um, just got drafted by the Atlanta Falcons. Um, but, I mean... I think it definitely plays a role here, but I wouldn't be, I don't feel comfortable saying definitively today that it's going to be Jaden Daniels because of Mike Dunbrock's pass with Desmond Ritter. Um, it very well could be, but I think that um, that Garrett Nussmeyer, that Miles Brennan, and of course Walker Howard as well, but I'm just going to leave him out of the conversation just for now because I don't believe that he um, has the intention of starting this year. Maybe he does. I don't know. Um, I wouldn't count on it, but I look at Garrett Nussmeyer, Miles Brennan, they both are very talented quarterbacks as well. Um, so they have a difficult decision to make. Maybe Jaden Daniels is a starter. Maybe Mike Dunbrock is able to do with, with Jaden Daniels what he did with Desmond Ritter. But I don't know. And I think it's a very interesting thing to monitor throughout spring practice. Um, next question it says, what do you make of the Twitter post that said LSU's biggest liability is the offensive? Um, so I saw this, this Twitter post that kind of caught a lot of fire. Um, I need to double check and see who posted that just so y'all can, oh, here it is. Big Game Boomer, at Big Game Boomer on Twitter, uh, put out this tweet that says the biggest liability on every team this season. And it, it, it lists out all the big the big teams in college football. You know, Arizona, the offensive line, Arizona State, NCAA sanctions, Iowa offense, Iowa State tight end. It just basically listed the biggest weaknesses of every um 
every school. And LSU says offensive line. Um, you know what I say about that? I don't care what big game boomer has to say about my football team, to be completely honest with you. I mean, maybe they're right. Like, that is one of my concerns about this this LSU team is the offensive line that seemed incredibly porous in the spring game that allowed so many sacks. It is it a younger offensive line. It'll be looking at Will Campbell potentially starting at left tackle, albeit he's an incredibly talented left tackle. Um, this could be an offensive line that is young and maybe inexperienced. And so, yeah, I think that is a, an area of LSU that I've been focusing on is just making sure the development of that offensive line is coming along smoothly because they're going to be facing some tough defensive lines once they get into SEC play, even game one um, against Florida State. But I, big game boomer, like – I'm not going to be shaking in my boots about the offensive line just because some Oklahoma podcaster told me that I need to be worried. With respect to those people who run this rare account, I'm sure they're great. Um, but I'm just not going to let that fuel my concern about this LSU football team. I don't think it should affect you either. But that's going to do it for me today. Appreciate you all for making Locked On LSU your first listen every day. Now, coming up tomorrow, we'll have a preview of LSU baseball's matchup with Alabama over the weekend, as well as kind of a wrap up of some things that we may have missed over the week. So make sure to check us out tomorrow. And also, make your second listen Locked On SEC. Get all of your daily SEC news in less than 30 minutes with SEC expert Chris Gordy. It is free and available wherever you get your podcasts.